good afternoon uh, your time now uh, i will have a nine minutes video it's a video by a french journalist about the story of domestic workers in hong kong i think the reason why i want to present this video is because it represents all the dilemma difficulties and you know the internal conflict that uh, experienced by the domestic workers because the existing justice system but also the structural issues when it comes to uh, gender based violence poverty you know and other um, kind of structural issues that we are facing so before i go to my presentation so i'll, I'll play my video now What I'm going to share with you it was uh, some part of that was explained in that uh, movie. Uh, that's from the perspective of the victim. But I'm going to present to you some study, but also some challenges that we face when it comes to sexual violence. So in the movie, you saw there was one woman who was also raped by the employer. When that happened, I think that movie was made in 2012 or 13. And during that time also, there were several other cases of sexual violence that we handled. Two of them were rape. So the sexual uh, or rape cases happen time to time in our uh, care. And it, it continued to happen throughout. So the reason one, even during COVID-19, we also handled two cases that uh, two of them were handled now by uh, Evelyn. So she can tell you more later about their stories. But what we found as commonalities, uh, one of them was raped, the other one was sexually abused. The one was raped, the case was dropped by the prosecution uh, department. Uh, they said there is not enough evidence. The other one was able to go to the court and the employer was sentenced to three years, but now the employer appealed. So the, the domestic worker was not able to, were forced, both of them were forced to leave Hong Kong in order for the investigation to continue but also for them to reclaim back some of their monetary claim, like uh, salary or a ticket, you know. That become one of the biggest issue for the victim when they try to uh, claim, uh, to file cases against their employer because one of the requirements is they have to be a witness and remain in Hong Kong throughout the investigation and stay on and the whole case is concluded. When the case is concluded, for example, by the magistracy court and they want to claim their money from their employer, if the employers continue to appeal, they will not be allowed also to reopen their civil claim. So this is one of the difficulties they face. They are forced to stay in Hong Kong endlessly uh, without any time limitation. And during that time of investigation, they are not allowed to legally work. So this is the reason why a lot of uh, domestic workers uh, really try to reconsider of whether or not they have to file legal cases. Uh, that's why we believe that the number of sexual abuse cases that has been reported to the government is much smaller than the actual number of uh, sexual violence that experienced by domestic workers. So what are the commonalities that we found among all these cases, whether it is during COVID-19 or before? Many of them are new in Hong Kong. They are less than like one year or even two years. Most of them, they were not given the off or they are not allowed to go out at all during COVID-19. Uh, the employer asked them to stay at home because of uh, the infection. And then uh, all of them were involved with paying agency fee, which is around six to seven months of their salary. So they know that they have to pay this fee, otherwise their family will be threatened. So they have to try to stay and endure in whatever condition happened within the house. And their passport, their employment contract were also kept by either employer or the, the agency. And that also some of the documents were also kept by the agency in Indonesia. So in Indonesia, uh, most of the domestic workers, particularly among Indonesian, yeah, it doesn't happen to all nationality, but particularly among Indonesian, the original document like ID, family certificate, uh, school diploma, or merit certificate were kept by the agency until they complete their agency fees. Otherwise, they cannot retrieve the document. Many of those victims, actually, they already informed the agency about the sexual violence uh, when they, exp you know, during their contract. But the agency always advised them to stay and endure and uh, without giving them very concrete solution in terms of filing, reporting the cases or leave the employer house. 
and most of the victim do not know who else to call, you know, except the agency. And they also do not know the number and the address of the consulate for help. So many of those who were denied rescue, uh, and also the Hong Kong government do not allow them to change employer until they complete the two years contract, they felt imprisonment and they have no choice except to survive. And then they don't have any outside connection and unaware to approach when they face abuse. Uh, and definitely throughout this uh, very critical months of first uh, one year employment, they really face uh, physical, verbal, and even sexual abuse. So this is the report from the Mission for Migrant Workers in 2020, which is very recent. So uh, most of the cases, if you can see in the statistic, it really a labor-related problem. But the second is there is also increase of abusive treatment, and that include physical, sexual rape, and including online cheating and cyberbullying. And high agency fee is uh, falling into the number three. So you can see here that um, seven out of ten experience ill treatment, one out of five experience physical violence, three out of 50 experience sexual harassment and rape that increased four percent during COVID-19. None of ten people experience long working hours, one in two people work during holidays, one on, in three people are not paid uh, when they uh, work during holidays. So before COVID-19, what I want to say, uh, sexual violence continued to be rampant. Uh, among domestic workers, but become worryingly uh, increased during COVID-19. Part of that is the denial of rest day, that the victim have no access even to seek help, it become one of the major reasons. So the mission also released a statistic in 2012, the abuse uh, statistic among domestic workers, 58% experience verbal abuse, 18% experience physical abuse, and 6% experience uh, sexual abuse. So as I already mentioned that uh, most victims uh, do not report their cases. As uh, what I mentioned, uh, one of the reasons is because they feel ashamed of even talking about that incident. Uh, in our culture, especially in Indonesia, I believe also among Chinese, uh, when you speak about sexual violence, you are as if you are reaping out your own dignity as a woman, you know, then people will assume that you are a whore, people assume that you are flittering with that guy, that's why you are being raped. So instead of being assisted, supported, we are the one being blamed for what happened. So that's why most of the uh, domestic worker prefer to be silent and not speaking out because otherwise they will be socially stigmatized and they are very afraid if their family learn about this kind of cases. So they really don't want their family back home to know about this, this incident. The second reason, as I already mentioned before, that they are not given opportunity to find another job while their own ongoing cases. And that's the reason why when they consider the loss of filing legal cases, with how much they can earn for, to support their family, they prefer to, to work again. So as in the statistic in 2020, the number of domestic workers uh, is uh, reaching 373,000, but the number declined during COVID-19. As you know that many people are not able to enter Hong Kong anymore. Hong Kong become very restrictive and it's not easy to reapply. Uh, many of those need to wait for at least even six to one year, what, six months to one year just to enter Hong Kong. So the number has been declining recently. And most of the domestic workers are coming from Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Nepal, few from Myanmar and Bangladesh. So what are the common conditions experienced by domestic workers? Uh, this is again based on a study conducted by Mission for Migrant Workers. Most of them are overworked and there is no uh, restriction in terms of resting or working hours. So in general, we have to live in with the employer. It is a regulation. You are not allowed to live out. You know, If you live out, you are criminal. Both employer and employee can be prosecuted by the government. And that's the reason why regardless of how small Hong Kong housing, we are forced to stay together. And when you live in with your employer and there is no working hours or resting hour regulation, you practically stay 24 hours standby. And in general, we work between 12 to 16 hours every day. And during COVID-19, the working hours actually extend up to 19 to 20 hours a day. So many of them work from you know as early as 5 a.m., 5.30, all the way up to 1 a.m. Yeah. 
and then uh, the wages is also very very low i believe you know that the wages is only 4600 and with the inflation that happen every year in hong kong and then plus during COVID-19, we get no financial subsidy at all from the government. This wages is very inadequate. So many of us are forced to cut down even our food expenses on Sunday. We cannot send more money for our family back home. We have to really squeeze little, little of money that we have so we can buy mass, sanitizer, vitamin C, and other things that make us healthy because uh, not all family are providing uh, sufficient food healthy food for the domestic workers. And then uh, the accommodation is uh, also inappropriate. Yeah, So 57%, we have our own room, but the room provided usually is also double function room. It's either storage, computer, or study for pet or for dog, for cat, you know, and for uh, laundry, ironing, or other type of uh, function within the house. So it's not like our own private room, you know, but it's a multi-use of a room. And then 43%, we have no private room. We are sleeping in the toilet, living room, back door, closet, music room, dressing room, a rooftop, sometimes in the divided space or even in the cabinet, yeah? And uh, in terms of amenities, that means uh, the usage of toilet and other facility within the house, there is also a limitation into that. We are not access to toilet is okay, but not all the time. Uh, sometimes the room no heater, no aircon. Sometimes there is no window, no bedding. So all these things, even in my case, when I came to Hong Kong, the bed where I slept was not even even mattress. So I literally slept on the wood. And they just uh, cover with, you know, bed sheet and that's all, you know. So it's very hard, painful to sleep throughout, you know, for many months that I work for them. So that kind of treatment is very real. And then the food, uh, even under the law, we're supposed to be given a food by the employer or food allowance. But in actual, uh, most of the employer just give them uh, either leftover food, uh, cup noodle or, you know, instant noodle. It's good enough if they give you egg, you know, or sausage. Uh, sometimes for breakfast and lunch in the house, you just eat it. Or sometimes they just give you really just instant noodle. So, and the dinner will be given like leftover or sometimes sharing with the family. But then with the offer work, the lot of the work that we do, sometimes, most of the time, it's not enough. So uh, many domestic workers have to spend a certain amount of their salary to buy extra food during their holiday, like festival, uh, fruit, you know, so they will be healthy as well. So another uh, limitation uh, that the reason why domestic workers, uh, you know, many of these issues are not being uh, reported is really about the visa restriction, yeah? Because uh, in Hong Kong, um, if you lose the contract, you are required to leave within two weeks for you to find another contract. Unlike other job, where you lose the job, you just find another job and just stay until you get a new visa. But for us, you have to leave within two weeks and then you can reapply. It will take at least three months to six months for you to come back. And when you come back, you still have to pay again another amount of agency fee. Sometimes you have to pay three months, 9000 or 15000 again. So that's why a lot of domestic workers are very afraid to report because that means they have to repeat again the same agency fee they paid before and they lose how many months of not earning money and not supporting their family. So as much as possible, if they have a way to survive, you know, uh, and they don't die inside the employer house, they will just stay on, yeah? And then uh, if you have a case, for example, uh, you can stay in Hong Kong, but again, you are legally not allowed to work, and then you don't receive any public medical support or maybe social security support. So if you are terminated, you cannot even go to hospital because you have no more access to insurance, and therefore the hospital do not cover your medical fee. So most of the domestic workers in our case, we have to seek a private doctor. We have to raise money so that they can go to the private uh, hospital or private uh, clinic. Or sometimes we work with a Chinese doctor to give them a free or cheap services. So this kind of very unfair treatment, especially for those who are like, you know, uh, a rape or pregnant or uh, suffering from cancer. And then recently, a lot of domestic workers are denied to work again because uh, those who lose the job more than once are accused of job hopping. That means you are not going to be eligible to find a new job if you lose contract more than once or twice. And then 
there are more discrimination that we experience by the government. For example, we have no right to be a permanent resident uh, compared to other foreigners. There is also a certain code of W in our Hong Kong ID. And then in the airport, you put them, they put us in certain counter, not that we... The reason why me personally, I don't like it because why you put us differently while other resident is there. And then the treatment of the staff in the counter is very different with the officer when I enter in the counter of a Hong Kong resident, you know. So they are more rude. They just don't talk to you uh, in the good manner and they always harass you. I mean, that's how I felt, yeah. And also when you go to the police immigration, it's very different when you come on your own or you come with our local volunteer to assist. That's why whenever we try to report physical abuse, sexual abuse cases, we have to make sure we have a local friend and good interpreter to assist. Otherwise, the police will not take that seriously. And again, the mandatory leave in become one of the reasons why sexual abuse become very, very common among domestic workers. Within the social level, the scapegoat is very common. I believe you heard how the during COVID-19, we keep being blamed for infection uh, spread within Hong Kong. And then <clears throat> when we gather in public space, we are also being stigmatized as a dirty. We are very disrespectful, uh, disobedient. Uh, when we try to access certain businesses, for example, they don't entertain domestic helper. So we have a lot of uh, stigma within the you know, business and public society. So the impact to that is uh, we are highly isolated. Within the house, we are isolated. Outside the house, we are isolated. We feel very lonely. And then our health also degree de- de- uh, deteriorating. You know, many of us having hypertension, anemia, cancer, and so forth. The number of uh, death, died migrants, uh, quite worrying. You know, in 2016, 144 just for one year, either they because of health, uh, some people also falling from the high rise uh, window. And then we are very vulnerable to physical, sexual, you know, and emotional stress. No privacy. Uh, we cannot complain what happened inside the house. And then the agency continue to exploit us. And also we are forced uh, whenever we go out to find another employer, we have to stay in the overcrowded boarding house given by the agency because Hong Kong government and our own consulate do not provide any facility for us. And we have to pay on our own. So our advocacy for the Hong Kong government, of course, we ask them to allow domestic workers to freely change employer without leaving Hong Kong and stop accusing of us of job hopper because Hong Kong allow people to change job. You know, it's, it's very normal for people to lose job and change job. But when it comes to domestic worker, we are tied up into one employer, one contract, and are not allowed to change job, you know, regardless what happened. And then uh, we also ask the government to allow us to live out in case the employer house is too small or there is no room to even rest properly. It should be negotiation, you know. So then the employer will also have their own privacy. We also have our own safety. And also to regulate the standard working or resting hour and put it in the contract. Like how many hours really is our working hours or at least resting hours. And then also to make uh, food uh, to be regulated also, not depend to just whatever employer gave. And also the sleeping accommodation, it should be also regulated. Those places that is considered indecent should be illegalized. That means we can file case, we can change employer. As for now, all these violations are not considered human right or legal violation. So therefore, it's not the basis of even moving to another employer or filing claim against employer. And our advocacy to our in Indonesian, but not only Indonesian, yeah, Philippine, Thailand, uh, and other nationality, is really to provide broader services for their domestic workers, not only in Hong Kong Island, but also even new territories, Kowloon. They also need to provide fast and responsive complaint services because many of them, we are complaining for very slow response. When we meet, they don't pick up the call. They always blame us whenever we try to call them for assistance. And then we also ask them to allow us to process our own contract without the agency because within Indonesian government in particular, it is mandatory to process every two years contract with the agency. We are not allowed to process on our own. And this is very unfair. We have to pay agency all the time. 
and to backlist employers who commit uh, abuse and or prohibit dom- domestic workers to take a rest day and blacklist the agency who offer charts or keep our documents and reduce the fees, which is one of the reasons why the domestic worker are afraid to complain. So I hope I give you all this overview, but just to, to give conclusion on this also, the sexual abuse doesn't only happen for us in Hong Kong. In fact, in our experience when we organize domestic worker, uh, many of them also experience sexual abuse even in their uh, home area, either by the school, by the community, uh, anyone in the community, or even sometimes by their family members. So uh, we notice now that when we try to provide this kind of paralegal counseling uh, or organizing with our community, more and more women are coming out and say, I used to experience sexual violence, physical abuse by their loved one. You know, So now we are trying to develop more uh, social psychological support for them. We recruit more psychologists, Indonesian or uh, different nationality psychologists to support the traumatic healing of this uh, woman. They also experience sexual abuse in the agency uh, training center before they come to Hong Kong. Uh, some of them were sexually molested by the agency owner or staff. Or when the agency put them in a house for so-called training or they made them doing a part-time job before they come here, they also experience uh, sexual abuse by their so-called employer. And even some of them were forced to have, um, how to say, forced contraception. Yeah, uh, Some agency also made it as regulation. So we are still studying all these uh, realities uh, or facts and we try to do some advocacy with our Indonesian government and of uh, sexual abuse practice can be stopped. Yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to ask Evelyn if the CB case you discussed is the same one where you guys also launch a judicial review. Yes. Okay, okay. So, so yeah, because um, I've, I've been reading about it in the news and it seems like quite a landmark victory. And so... Were there any follow up on the part of the police department and DOJ about, you know, having a specific um, trafficking law that helps us this kind of situation? Unfortunately, no, because they're appealing (laughs) the decision. Um, So typical um, of the government, they would want to appeal this. And I think that they would want to appeal it right up to the court of final appeal before they would do anything Um, as a, to 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 explain to our audience what that case is about. So after um, after all the sexual exploitation, we uh, argued to the we actually before going to trial, um, we wrote to the police saying that actually um, this man is a trafficker because we have evidence or at least very strong indications that he has done the same thing to all his foreign domestic helpers. Not all, but at least all the previous ones that we know about. So if he has done the same thing to every one of his foreign domestic helpers, that means that at the time when he hired the foreign domestic helper, he already wanted to do that thing to them. He already wanted to sexually exploit them. So that fits the definition of an, a trafficker who has deceived the, the um, foreign domestic helper into the contract knowingly, um, knowing that she... He, She's not being a, just a normal domestic helper. She's, she would be forced to provide sexual services. So we wanted to bring that atten- to the police attention because we thought that prosecution at the magistrate level is too low. We wanted it to be higher up. Um, we also wanted them to consider whether to lay more charges against the employer because we thought that just two charges um, for countless incidents um, is too, again, too little. Um, but they came back to say that they don't think that um, she was a victim of trafficking and or, or, or she they don't think that she was a victim of forced labor. And forced labor includes sexual in- exploitation. Um, and so we uh, challenged that by a judicial review um, and we won in uh, the court of first instance. So the court of first instance thought that um, it was um, a, a case of forced labor and that um, the police should have done more to investigate. So they shouldn't have just uh, have a blinkered view and just look at 
this one victim. If they have evidence that there are several other victims, they should have looked into that as well to see whether there's a pattern of sexual exploitation that is happening. Um, but they didn't. The police just um, looked at one victim and one case. So we thought that was wrong and the court agreed with us. Um, but now the government is appealing that decision. So um, it remains to be seen. Um, and also, also one the reason why it's a landmark decision is because um, the court said that Hong Kong should have um, a tailor-made offense uh, against forced labor. Because um, if you think about it, even if he's char just charged of indecent assault, that doesn't capture um, the heinousness of what he has done because he has trafficked women and he has forced them to be his sexual tools. Um, so what else is there to charge against him? And, and the court thought that, okay, we should have a separate offense which will reflect um, what he has done, the trafficking and the, and the forced labor. So it, it's a landmark in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, we got a question uh, in the chat box from Ashley. Uh, Ashley said, thank you for Amy and Evelyn's comprehensive sharing. Her question is that given the live-in requirement and often cramped living conditions in the household, what might be some available solutions for abused domestic workers seeking shelters for a prolonged period of time apart from the uh, perpetra uh, perpetrators and other abusive employers enabling the abuse without getting deported. I think maybe Enmi could could address this question. What are what are the options available for them? Thank you. Uh, I think the immediate one is for the government to create uh, this hotline center, emergency hotline center for particular uh, cases like abuse, physical, sexual abuse where it is uh, not just a normal uh, complaint. So I think hotline with interpretation will be very helpful as a first aid to rescue the woman when they face this kind of issues. The second is, of course, provide a free uh, accommodation for this woman while they are having their cases. You know, uh, during COVID-19, we can witness the Hong Kong government can always create policy uh, where a place can become a temporary uh, quarantine facility, for example, right? So it's the same. I mean, uh, they can always appoint one place, as two or three places, for these uh, women workers to, to stay while they are having cases. As for now, the Hong Kong government are not taking that responsibility, and they are passing it to, you know, to this uh, NGO, who are hardly enough to survive with this kind of, you know, cost of living in Hong Kong. So it's very irresponsible in the part of Hong Kong government. They always say they are upholding justice, you know, like uh, diversity and human rights. But in the actual practices, look at the domestic workers, they have no even support as simple as place to stay while they are making reports. So I think this is one very basic thing. Along with the stay, of course, is the food, the transport, and all this support that Evelyn was mentioning, psychological support and so forth. Another thing is, of course, giving us right, giving them right to find a new job when they are ready. So I think that's one way also to give them uh, a justice in that sense. They don't have to be unemployed for a year or two just because they want to be a witness for the prosecution, right? So that's very that's actually double injustices. I can say triple injustices. One you are once you are abused, you know, because of the whole structural policies. Second, you are being uh, abandoned on the street without any proper support from the government, and the third, you are denied job. You know, so to reverse that situation is really to provide what government should do. As simple, you know, for the victims. So I think that kind of things. But I think beyond that, what I agree with Evelyn, there is really a need to change the mindset of uh, Hong Kong public. You know, I agree completely. Uh, it is different perhaps to some extent when a local woman reporting uh, sexual abuse with domestic worker reporting sexual abuse. First come to their mind is always, you might be the one, you know, seducing your employer. Second, oh, you are filing case now because you want money out of it. 
So it is something that um, very dehumanizing. And just to let you know also in our culture, uh, at least in the Muslim culture of Indonesia, uh, when you are trying to tell the truth and then somebody say, oh, you are using this to get more money. The first instinct of a woman, they will dare not to report. Like, why should I put my dignity? My dignity is already toppled down by this employer, crippled down. And now when I try to tell them the truth, again, I was, my dignity was stepped on it by this government official or the police. So there is this very strong sense of, you know, dignified <laughs> Uh, pride that we have to protect, uh, you know, if there is no justice we can get, then I don't want to get another uh, injustices or, you know, uh, humiliation, something like that. There is this kind of very strong culture. I don't know whether that also apply to, to the Chinese contact, for example, but for Indonesian, if you tell them, oh, you might be the one, uh, you know, uh, you, you might want to have sex with your employer too, you know, and that's now you want, you, you don't get money. That's why you are doing this, blah, blah, blah. The first thing, you know, of course, it's very reactive, but this is very cultural also in our country. So that's why for us to assist a victim of sexual violence, it's, a, it's the same with you are mobilizing the whole village just to assist one person. You have to mobilize everyone, including their family, you know, and, and their friends, you know, and, and all of us to convince them, you know, this is the only way to fight for justice, you know. So, again, when we talk about the sexual violence, I imagine this as if you are fighting a tyranny, you know, it is invisible. You are not just officing a police officer, but this police officer represents the point of view of the society, you know, the prejudice of that society to you, you know, and all this uh, unfair, discriminatory attitude and regulation of that uh, country, for example. So it's not just merely about presenting an evidence, you know, and while in the, that's why when I say about the sexual violence, it is very deep-rooted, hidden, invisible structure, within our subconscious mindset of, of, of the people. And with, for the government official, as simple as, okay, you are being reported or evident. Do you have the sperm? Do you have, uh, you know, the underwear of your male employer? You know, how could you even, you know, so they, they treat this kind of sexual violence equal to physical abuse. That's why most of the cases, the recent case that I handled personally, she decided not to file this because the male employer was just, you know, hugging her all the time, hugging her, you know, and then always walking in front of the toilet door whenever she was taking a bath, you know. So she, we, we tried to tell her, okay, get recording, uh, write the letter, you know, we write a letter to immigration and to the, to the labor department and the consulate, blah, blah, blah. But then when she, when, you know, even that is, you know, I do not know whether that is even strong evidence. There is no sperm, there is no sexual, but it happened all the time. The, 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 the old man always hug her from behind, toss her breast, kiss her, and so forth and so forth, you know. So, and, it, and that happened at any given time. So she cannot always like, you know, like put my camera and do like this, you know, she cannot do that, you know. So that's one of the difficulties in getting evidence. And then plus when you say to the police, they will ask the first thing is the evidence. But how could you get an evidence in this kind of scenario? And then the third, when we tell them about the, the, the consequences of reporting, you have to stay for three months, six months, one year, blah, 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 and, and all these things, she will just like, I'm not going to do that. I have two children at home. I have to pay all this stuff. How will I work? How will I fight justice? And I will be unemployed for one year. You know, no way. So that always the pros and cons. So that's why I say what you see in the report um, data is very, very minor compared to the actual reality there out there. Yeah. So I think that's, yeah. But at least if the government improve this 
supporting system. I think the people will think twice. Okay, then I will file my case. Anyway, I can have a free accommodation. I can find another job. Then why not? You know, but now no way. Yeah. Thank you, Annie. I think you really explained what's so difficult about reporting social violence very well. And I think it's not just limited to foreign domestic workers, but in general. Um, also, like for uh, give a little bit context to perhaps some of our mainland Chinese uh, uh, audience, like during the COVID nineteen or during the fifth wave, which is few months ago in Hong Kong. So there have been a lot of harrowing reports of foreign domestic helpers just being evicted out of their house and they had to sleep on the streets. And there have been like very difficult, the pictures that are very difficult to look at as well. And I guess to me, it is a little bit ironic because, you know, as Hong Kongers, our, our, our household needs someone to live in with us to be, to, to be our helper, but then, you know, when when COVID happened, when there's the risk of getting in, infected with COVID and they immediately kick them out. And it's such a horrible thing um, that I don't think Hong Kong is talking enough about. Um, I guess uh, I also have another question actually for Evelyn. Uh, you briefly talked about, you know, there have been judicial review challenging the live-in requirements but they have been unsuccessful. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about why it is, why it has failed in court? About why it's unsuccessful? Yeah. Oh, it's because, um, and the same thing happens with um, the challenge against permanent residency. So um, because foreign domestic helpers um, cannot get permanent residency, even if they have stayed here for seven years. Um, whereas any other expat in Hong Kong, if they have worked for seven years and stayed in Hong Kong for seven years, they can be PR. So um, both of these cases, the court has sort of carved out the foreign domestic regime as a specific immigration context. So they have said that it's different from all other normal, um, uh, usual uh, labor contexts. Um, and because there is a specific legislation and specific legal regime governing foreign domestic helpers, that's why um, they are not treated unfairly. They're not discriminated against. It's just, diff they are just different, right? And for the living requirements specifically, one of the arguments that the court relied upon was that um, the reason why there was a lift-in requirement originally, many, many, many years before, was that um, there are two types of domestic helpers back then. There is um, the foreign domestic helper, which were brought in by uh, the British people, <laughs> British uh, rich people, <laughs> colonial people. And there was also local foreign domestic helpers. Uh, previously, we have um, uh, local Hong Kongers being uh, doing domestic work. And so at the time when this foreign domestic helper regime was started, it was actually to cater those British colonialists who wants to bring their helpers to Hong Kong. So at the time, in order to differentiate that from the local, local, local helpers, um, and so as not to compete against the local domestic helpers, so the lift-in requirement was put in as a legal condition for the foreign domestic helpers to come. And to this day, it's, it's there. And to this day, the court is still relying on this to say, oh, um, because one of the objectives was um, so that uh, you don't really come into competition with the local domestic helper employment market. I guess I have another question for me <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, I, I think in our previous discussion, we mentioned a bit about forced contraception. Uh, that may be mandated by agency. Is there anything that we can do about it? Because to me, it's it's not very ethical, and I'm sure that you know it could be illegal as well, right? Oh yeah. Well, that is within Indonesia. Uh, that applied. Okay. Uh, it, it is not a regulation, but some agency are doing it. The reason why they are doing it, they do not want to lose. 
um, the prospect client, right? Because uh, if we are getting pregnant, then we cannot leave uh, to Hong Kong or to other countries, then eventually, you know, they will lose the profit. So uh, some of them are forced, uh, even now, those who are in Hong Kong, for example, some of them in our research, the, the research has not been published yet, so it's still ongoing. But uh, there are certain uh, significant number of people who are forced to take uh, injection, uh, contraception by injection, even when you are still a virgin or you don't have husband or you don't have anyone, you know. So uh, because there was a time before we come here, we will have to stay in the agency training center for at least three months. And time to time, you are allowed to be visited by your family or you can visit your family. So in order to make you not pregnant, they just inject you. So there are few, some of our friends even have like physical consequences because of that. They cannot have, a, you know, they, they never have sex and they get this injection. So it stopped them from having menstruation, their body getting, you know, bigger and then they feel very, very uncomfortable, but they do not know what to do. So we are trying to work with some of, uh, you know, uh, doctor volunteer uh, to see what we can do for them. Yeah, but this has been uh, part of the issues in the past several years. So maybe when when the study is uh, ready, uh, we can share it with you. Yeah, of course, we ha one thing we have to say is the Hong Kong government, we can push the Hong Kong government to tell Indonesian government, why should you do that? You know, why should you you know, even allow, this is beyond imagination of forcing women to be, uh, you know, injected, you know, for the sake of employment. So, yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. But uh, we will uh, talk to you again when the research is ready. But the difficulty so, is is that these practices are done in Indonesia, right? So yes, in Hong Kong, legal, it's so hard to do anything. It doesn't, has nothing to do with legal law in Hong Kong. Uh, it's more like public pressure, to right. Indonesian, of course, when you shame Indonesian government, they will really do something. That's one key to pressure, you know, in Philippine Indonesian government is for for us to speak out loud and then make it so inhuman. <laughs> then suddenly they will do something because they don't want to be ashamed internationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess this this reminds me of another report that I saw from Pathfinders. And I remember they have like for some pretty shocking statistics, you know, 84% of respondents think they can dismiss the, the, the pregnant domestic helpers because, because they will not be able to perform their work duties. And I guess, I guess, you know, something that we can do on our side in Hong Kong is just raising awareness and, you know, letting employ, employers know that they, they don't have the right to do that. So her question is to Evelyn. Um, she said, legal services in Hong Kong can be a big burden for, for foreign domestic helpers who are not so well off. Uh, she would like to know what is the reason for you and your firm to provide legal services for foreign domestic helpers? And did you uh, receive any financial support from the public sector? I think uh, Evelyn could address this oh, first. Um Yes, it's one of the reasons why we help foreign domestic helpers. Um, a lot of times uh, our advice and our assistance is done on a pro bono basis, which means we do it for free um, before they can get legal aid. Sometimes they can't get legal aid. Um, and we can't actually get any financial support um, from the public sector because in Hong Kong, there's a rule against uh, paying, like funding uh, solicitors or lawyers to to pursue certain types of legal work. It's called champion, the rule against champerty and maintenance. Um, so we're not like an NGO or a charity where we can raise funds to pay our bills. So most of our work is free uh, and we need to find other ways to help us survive financially. And this is also the reason why there are so few uh, lawyers out there who offer pro bono services. Um, for the vulnerable community. Um, but I hope this will um, uh, change, but i um, not sure. Um, Hezia also has a question for Annie. Uh, she's asking, what is the association situation of foreign domestic helpers in Hong Kong? Uh, is it easy for newly arrived helpers to find 
uh, say, a, an organization or a community that can help them? Well, uh, a lot of domestic work, I can say in Hong Kong, there are around maybe around 500 uh, community groups. I, uh, when I say community groups, they are not registered. They are just uh, a group of people coming from different nationality or the same province or the same uh, hobby who get together to do something together, you know. And along the way, this kind of uh, community groups a big uh, other one where they share their problem, their stories, and their difficulties. So uh, majority of this group are not group who are aware about the legal system in Hong Kong. There are few who are more into advocacy. So that's why uh, our role now is actually educating our own community groups to be more aware where to seek help, at least the basic principle of your, your right and also where to seek help, what to do when you have this kind of uh, diff uh, different cases, yeah? So, but uh, uh, the, the groups are available out there. Uh, usually, now with the social media, it is more easier to be connected. So usually we receive cases from social media, like, oh, look at this case from Yun Long, blah, 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 you know? So then we just call them. Something like that. So we are very active also in social media life. We are connected with a lot of social media groups and e-groups. Uh, the important here now is education to the foreign domestic workers uh, leaders. Uh, it is the key to how, how the community can be empowered and protected. In my case, for example, uh, it was because uh, as a domestic worker, I learned my right. And then from knowing my right and having my case, I tell and I use this as my guide to help others. So that's why that's how the style of our community uh, organizing. We empower the domestic workers for them to help others. So we try to create more uh, what we call it the uh, contact people in, in new territories, Kowloon, Hong Kong Island, uh, wherever they are. So from there, we will spread out the flyer, the brochure, the news. Uh, so yeah, we are we are like you know uh, rooted and grounded to that extent. But again, this is self-organized. There is no funding involved. We cannot even ask for money because we don't have any registration. Uh, registration is not that easy here because we should have an office. And you know, with with our group, we only rely on our membership uh, donation, which is only twenty dollar a month sometime from selling a t-shirt uh, or just fundraising. So we usually rely on our own uh, financial capacity. So that's why I can say very little of the group are registered under the Hong Kong government uh, uh, society registration or the trade union. Most are not. And we do not get any funding. We are self-reliant uh, organization. But that's, that's, that's the beauty also that we have. You know, we are independent. That means we, we survive in, in the, the good and the bad times. Even when there is, we know how to, because we are very, we are thin reliant. As I mentioned, it is not enough when somebody run away. We do not know where to put them. <laughs> We just know how to pick up a call and give them advice, right? But we do not know where to put them when they have to be terminated or where they are being abused. So this is where the intervention of the NGO and even the government and the consulate become very, very critical. So I was wondering um, for like both of you, which, of, which one of the two priorities do you think is more effective? Making laws against employers from like being predators is more important or whether having laws to safeguard the helpers' welfare is more important. Oh, I, I would say um, both are would be encapsulated within legislature's um, schemes that protect foreign domestic helpers, because then it necessarily also deters um, sexual predators or, or, or restricts the possible environments where they can show their ugly hands, right? So um, I would say definitely a legal legislation um, protections would help a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, but it all, it's, as, as we, Annie and I have been trying to say, it's not just the law that helps. It's also how you implement the law, how people being imperfect human beings with their prejudices and biases um, uh, enforce the law. And it's here where sexual violence cases 
suffer the most uh, impediments because um, if, because of the we're living on the patriarchy basically plus a, a community where foreign domestic helpers are seen as second class citizens um, who don't deserve the same dignity and um, um, and treatment. So it's both these different uh, these um, vulnerabilities that is pressing upon the situation with foreign domestic helpers experience sexual violence. Um, so I think it's not just law, it's also how you implement or how you handle the law that will, um, uh, that will be important. So for instance, in sexual violence cases, even in general, we have the laws here, but why are there so few prosecutions for sexual violence cases? It's all down to how people see um, what constitutes sexual violence, what constitutes a good case, um, or whether this person is deserving of help, right? So I, I think it goes both both ways. Um, uh, and thank you for your question. But I think a, a, a good law can encapsulate both protecting the victim and also enforcing against the perpetrator. <laughs>